Okay, welcome to the presentation. In this one, we're going to continue with our conversation about better shells. In this one, we're going to be focusing now back on the idea of experimental structures being able to be something that we can trace through the idea of models and the tools. So specifically, we're going to be looking at the evolving use of physical prototypes in structural shell design between 1959 and 1974. The dates here that we're using, are, as you'll see, are bracketed between up at the very first international conference on structural shells in 59, and then in 1974, a change in which computational work really started to affect this overall idea of shell design. So one of the questions is we always like to reframe this thing as we're talking about experimental structures is, why are then experimental shell structures designed and built the way that they are? And we have our listing here of the long vaults and the short vaults and the anticlastic domes and the ruled surfaces and the high bars, all the different things that we've talked about to this point. And when we think about why they have these predictable sort of shapes, we start to contemplate what is it about this predictability. So in order to make an experiment, ideally not fail, we learn from other experiments. And as we learn from other experiments, what we're looking for is predictability. Whether these are in the candela uh, umbrella-like columns, sometimes this predictability is about these rules that are able to allow us to generate the form. Not just be able to generate a form which we know what it's going to look like, but we have to be able to document this formal geometry. The other predictability that we're after is that we know that structural behavior, like where the stresses occur, depends on the form. So if we can understand then, or be able to predict, anticipate how a form creates certain types of stresses. In this one, the Taroha sort of folded paper idea, and you can see the understanding then in the slide of where the tension stresses are gonna be versus where the compression stresses are in the shell. That then allows you to sort of tune the design of the shell with different materials, in this case the rebar, where the stress is going to be. The other predictability that we want though as we're talking about materials is to think how those materials are going to respond to the shell behavior. In this case we're looking at uh, the Waller shells of the fabric, the burlap sacks, and how those things are going to fold and become con concave, and when of course they're coated they become stiffer, lightweight shells. And ideally, as DSD showed us in the Gaussian vaults that we were looking at, try to find a way in which the form of the shell, the behavior of the shell, the materials that are used, and the constructability are all considered together. So the predictability of all of it means that one thing isn't necessarily going to be a wild card that you're able to actually anticipate. And what we saw with DSD's work is he's able to understand those factors so well, he's able to tune this in a way so that then the light is coming into these spaces and we get more than just a structural enclosure. So again, this idea of predictability in the shell form, we have the developable, the single curvature ones, the long and short vaults. This one's pretty easy to understand, right? It's all, it's a curve that's generated across a straight line. The, the synclastic or the domes, we also know that it, although it's double curved, which is gonna make it more difficult to construct, it's a relatively predictable geometry. Right, the curve's going to rotate around that central axis point. The anticlastics, of course, get much more difficult of this double curvature because there's a directed curve line in which in two different axes. Right? We looked at the value of the hyperbolic paraboloids in which the double curvature is actually derived from the, the straight lines. One consideration, though, is we're, as we're going forward in something that puts in context with what we have talked about before. Shell structures are not only like these reductive and predictable things. They're forms, space, buildings. It's architecture, they have to do more. And so I know that we've been talking about these from the perspective of structural design, structural behavior, constructability, and then oftentimes we come back to these very, very, very kind of practical ideas because frankly, that's where a lot of the experimentation came from was trying to make these really practical things actually applicable and, and something that can happen. But it's also important to understand that just because something is difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. That in fact, one of the issues with shells, one of the reasons that shells started to die out is because this predictability kind of had this unintended consequences. As you know, it's one of my 
thesis points about shells is that once the uh, ACSE put out the manual 31 for the design standards for thin shells, once you could actually have this formula in which you understood, you know, what the actual span was going to be and the thickness of what it was going to be. And in other words, you can know the shell behavior based on these other factors. You kind of enter in all these things and suddenly you get a shell that's going to behave the way that you know that the shell's going to, going to, you know, act. So all that's fine and it's really great. It's able to bring shells to a whole new range of different uh, building typologies, but it's the predictability, the idea that a shell is something that could be derived actually from a formula. But when we return to anti-clastic shells, we know that the, the double curvature of these, of these shells makes them incredibly expressive. And because it is a double curved shell, we also know that it's really efficient. We're looking here at different experiments of uh, Torojas that we had looked at in previous lessons as well, where he's experimenting with the form of it and sketches and elevations and the modeling. He's trying to model where the stresses are going to be and then predict that with a physical model as well. But the problem with these anticlastics is they are difficult to form. And so then because the form is difficult to derive, it also makes it more difficult to analyze. Where are the stresses going to go? It's an indeterminate structure, right? So the flow of forces and where those stresses are located it's not as predictable, again, as, say, a cylindrical shell or a vault. And then, obviously, it's more difficult to build as well. How do we actually define the physical geometry of these shells? And you look at some of Toroja's elevations here, and you just think, wow, imagine trying to find X, Y, and Z axis for this double-curved shape. Which gets us to this. Why the use of physical models, then, for structural and spatial shells? What we need to do then is not to just give up on the idea that difficult forms are hard to find. But physical models then, you can see Easler's experiments here and Friato too, which we'll be talking about in this lecture. They used physical models to generate structurally efficient forms. In doing so, both of them in very different ways discovered advanced construction methods, one in lightweight structures and one in shells. And being able to make these physical models, they use these physical models to help document these complex geometries. The use of a physical model, a form-finding model, of course, can be traced back to Gaudi's work, especially in compressive shells, Gaudi's work in the late 19th century, whether it's the weighted sandbags and the Sagrada Familia that's underneath the actual Sagrada Familia, you can still see the physical model, or the hanging chain model of the Colonia Gale Church. Uh, really fascinating things. Longer history to these, they took him more than a decade to these large, larger physical models, um, really difficult then to translate the model of these strings and the weight to the physical form and the behavior. But the idea of being able to use physical models to find form and to understand behavior is an old idea. So at the first meeting then at the International Association for Shell Structures, which it was called then, the inaugural meeting in 1959, uh, it was the, what they called actually the first Congress for International Association. This was founded, I should mention, by Toroja, and so the first conference was in Madrid in 1959. So reinforced concrete shells, because it was 59, were widely used at the time, almost exclusively these straightforward forms that we had talked about, right, the vaults, and these simple mathematical formula. So barrel vault, spherical dorm, uh, domes, and we know that some of the hyper, hyperbolic paraboloids that we saw from Candela had already been built in 59. So, Easler's presentation here, called New Shapes for Shells, was the last one to be presented in this session. And his paper was only five pages in length, and it contained fewer than a thousand words, which is kind of unbelievable to me. But it, it was illustrated with only nine figures. And so, the paper concluded, and we'll look at his paper in a minute here, concluded with this sketch over here to the right. 39 possible shell forms, which he had sketched, and he had put this label, etc., down here at the bottom to suggest that perhaps there were an infinite number of possible shell forms. So this is part of his presentation here, the new shapes for shells. And so it proposed three alternative form-finding methods for shells. One, the freely shaped hill, which a hill in the form of the dirt, natural compression of that, a shell could be cast over that. The membrane under pressure, meaning that you could inflate a membrane pneumatically and cast a dome on top of that. 
and the idea of a hanging cloth that's reversed. And the hanging cloth that's reversed is, of course, the signature idea here. So here you see the pneumatic form. Here you see the hanging cloth that's reversed. At the end of the session, there was a lot of conversation about this. I, I pull out this one, this one particular quote, the, a most unfortunate state of affairs. What Arup was worried about was that if anybody could, you know, derive the form of a shell, either by blowing up a balloon or just hanging some cloth, he was just worried that anyone's going to try to do a shell, right? Well, what's wrong with that? Well, see, what's wrong with this is that the first forays into, like, large international, super famous public buildings that use structural shells were actually done really poorly. We've looked at Eero Saarinen's Kresge Auditorium from 51 to 55. We know from what we've looked at before that there were not any structural principles with it. The model that they did use was mostly to test aesthetics. It had no structural thing at all. And the geometry of it was nearly impossible to build. It had structural failures, it was expensive, it didn't work as a shell. The concern is, if a designer thinks that any curved surface is a shell, that the benefits of a shell, being expressive and efficient, etc., would be diminished. At this time in 59, they also would have known about Aerosarinen's next shell that he'd also designed with Amon and Whitney, the TWA terminal. And uh, again, this one supposedly looked was a shell, but it wasn't a shell as all, and we had talked through this behavior uh, on previous lectures as well. I think Abator, one of the uh, young engineers who worked on this, put this pretty well when he talked about it. it needed to be tamed and domesticated. They did use physical models on TWA. These physical models were actually there, and they informed some of the structure and construction, but that wasn't their purpose. So in our earliest lectures, we talked about the different types of models. These were just meant to be representational models. They weren't confirmatory models. They weren't generative models. They were just representational. Arup is mostly pissed, of course, because of this ongoing work at the Sydney Opera House. The form of the shell wasn't derived from any structural principles, and the form continued to evolve over all these many, many years and all these many different schemes. So the models that were eventually built for the Sydney Opera House were done to establish some sort of guiding geometric principles. They had to try to figure out how to build this, how to document it, but they also needed to make this thing lightweight enough because, of course, the foundations were already poured. So the models were eventually used to test the structural capacity of what they came up with, but it wasn't to optimize the overall forms. So there's a bunch of really seriously interesting advancements that Arup's office had made in which they took these shells and tested them with these really high-tech principles just to make sure that they could see is there going to be too much excessive deformation in any of the shells in any of these locations. What Arup is concerned about is the, the end part of this. If anything is possible in terms of generating a shell form, okay, fine, we'll engineer it, we'll make it work. Because the architects were aware that there's this testing that was an acceptable idea of, of testing of these physical models because it had been going on for forever. These are in, shells are indeterminate structures, right? Which means that we're not exactly sure where all the forces are going to go. We can't predict it accurately mathematically. Now, we can, we can make some good guesses about where they're going to go, how much deformation is going to happen at what points of the shell. So the use of these physical models as confirmatory models provides the correlative evidence. At this point, there had been more than 25 years of testing of physical models. So it's a real thing to be able to say this is an acceptable mode of being able to use a physical model. So at the conference, uh, Easler had already completed 90 shells. 90. What Easler ends up saying is that he's using these things for form finding. But Easler is an engineer, so it's form finding with a purpose. He's looking for, in his quote here, the least materials disposed in the best way to resist the applied forces with the minimum of stress and deformation. Basically, perfect st structural shell behavior. And Easler tells a story about how he was exhausted working as an engineer and saw his pillow and just thought, 
hey, that's a perfect form, and kind of became obsessed by how he could actually find and derive a perfect structural form. So again, back to his illustrations here, he's showing how a pneumatic formwork, you could actually use that pneumatic formwork and cast a type of a bubble on top of it, or you could actually have a uh, hanging canvas, and from that hanging canvas, you could get this predictable shape. So he described to the skeptical audience that he has this really patient way of using physical models for testing, just as Nervi and just as Taroja had done as well. So he was looking at here as localized flexural or bending stress in the shell surface. So he built his models himself. He built the testing equipment, and his biographer, uh, John Chilton, describes this as painstaking process. He really only wanted to do it himself because he had to be super accurate, and it's repetitive, and it's really solitary. And I do think it's interesting to look at this and, and to think about how absolutely perfect and controlled that process had to be in order to make this predictable. So what does this actually give you? Well, he's trying to understand then how it's going to move if this is the actual final geometry. And if it moves too much, he has to start all over, recast it, and go again. Easler, though, was true to his word that there were many, many different forms that were possible and oftentimes like these anti-clastic double-curved shell forms that weren't just vaults. And so this is a particularly interesting one, this, the um, Cecilia say, factory shell in Geneva. And this, as you can see, 68, 69, 10 years after his conference proposal. And the reason I'm showing you is that he's not afraid to take chances. Uh, Chilton describes that there was 15 models used to define and refine the final shape that were found in the Isler archive. I'm adding also in here an image from, you know, best practices of shell behavior that, you know, was talking about discontinuous sur uh, surfaces and unresolved edges being really terrible ideas for shells. Like, don't do those, right? And yet, look at the actual shell down here. You see a discontinuous surface, and you see some kind of strange unresolved edges happening here. So while you may not want to do it, Easler is still kind of pursuing the idea that these aren't just only predictable geometric shell shapes, that there's absolutely room in here for expression. And this fabulous, you know, finished project, just, uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly unique, both in its expression. And what, what it really gets you is not only a very thin and efficient structural shape, but the structural shape then becomes the building enclosure then becomes the building form and the building expression as well. Another really interesting uh, Easler project that, that also goes beyond just the predictable shell shape is the Holy Spirit Church in, in Switzerland. Uh, this one is absolutely mind-boggling to me. He creates a, a tilted hypersurface, as you can see on the right here, coats that tilted uh, hypersurface with plaster, and then cuts out this leaf-like shape. This leaf-like shape then has a predictable geometry to it, which makes it so it's something that you can actually replicate. So you can draw it in plan, and you can draw it in section, and you can build it, and you can test it, even though it's not then, of course, at all, anything that looks like it's a predictable overall outline. As we go to Fry Auto and then Fry Auto's use of the physical models, you're going to see a lot of the similar motivations in terms of the creativity and efficiency and expressiveness that Fry Auto uses. It's a longer story that we'll get into when we deal with the lightweight structures module for this particular class, but in general we're going to skip to the founding of the Institute for Lightweight Structures, or ILIC or IL, at the University of Stuttgart in 1964. Fry Otto is uh, the founder in this. He's looking for lightweight, efficient, beautiful forms, tension cables, and membranes. Otto is incredibly idealistic about why he's doing this work. The, it deals with the idea of, frankly, just being able to build better, more sustainable, more adaptable. As it says here, a means to advance this process. You know, an infinite number of discoveries to make. With that, he means about these forms, that tension forms, of course, that it's going to form is going to follow the forces of it. 
So he would make these unbelievably like optimally tensed surfaces made out of soap bubbles. So he'd have these forms with wire and masks and he'd dip them in a soap bubble formula and then it, boop, the bubble would just form these minimally tense surfaces. He'd have to then photograph these uh, right away and try to understand the geometric behavior of these. Put together then a highly collaborative team of cross-disciplinary engineers, architects, researchers, all focused on building these things because these were, again, relatively unknown and underutilized building forms. And did a series of uh, three really interesting projects in, in pretty rapid succession. The German Pavilion, the Munich Olympic Roof, and the Mannheim Multi Hall. And with this, I should mention that there was larger groups of collaborators in all three of these projects as well. In the Montreal Pavilion, this was of course an exhibition, and the exhibition was meant to show and really highlight the creativity of this. There's years and years of research that Otto had done, including writing his thesis project about uh, a hanging chain. He'd done lots of research and, and that work with Strohmeyer, a tent manufacturer out of Germany. And so he really understood both how to design and build uh, um, these lightweight tent structures. So he's looking at large areas covered with minimal surfaces, right? He also knew that because this is going to be built in Montreal, it had to be transportable across the world and able to be built quickly and effectively. So he starts doing these physical models and then trying to define the overall shape and form of these physical models. He uses soap films, wire mesh, the sort of tully. Um, he builds one model at a particular scale and he's going to test it, test the behavior, what's going to happen when we load this up. And in fact, he's pulling the edges of it. He's, you know, uh, adding a little more tension here, adding a little uh, less tension there. Just to, And it, of course, changes the overall shape each time he does that. So ultimately, there's a 1 to 75 model. Uh, they used material that had similar elastic qualities so they could get predictable behavior out of it. Now, because it's only a representational physical model in terms of scale, any error there is amplified when it becomes a real full-scale building, which became one of the issues then as it uh, converts to Munich. And Munich, I should note, he was not on the original team that was selected for the Munich Olympic Stadium. In fact, the teams that were selected were trying to mimic the tent behavior that Otto had become quite famous for just a few years before. Uh, the design that was accepted, they weren't sure if it would actually be built after a couple years of deliberation and brought Fry Otto in and said, hey, you've got to help fix this. So Fry Otto's role was as a consultant with this, but he ended up basically being the person who modified the overall form. And as you can see here, used physical models to do so. How do you end up actually building and measuring these models? Well, there's, there's a formula for trying to get structural economy. If you can minimize cable lengths and minimize their diameter, meaning that you really want to try to trace again how forces are going to flow through this. So if you can find then the equilibrium, if I pull this a little bit tighter here, lift that up a little bit there, then there's a predictability in that stress distribution. So they use the photogrammetry process. Klaus Linkwitz, who was also uh, at the Institute of uh, Geodesy and the IFG, also in the Stuttgart area. And the idea of this is that he's going to take a giant model, set up a whole bunch of different cameras, and you can see the weights they are sitting on this table down below here. You can see the weights are getting ready to be dropped. As those are dropped, they take a picture before and immediately after. Then you can map the intersection points of the X, Y, and Z before and after loading. So then the, what became fascinating about this process is they entered these into this automatic drafting machine. They had to somehow keep track of these thousands and thousands of points, right? And so Otto wanted to keep building this bigger and bigger and bigger, but they realized that they were running out of time and they were running out of money. So um, they knew that in order to be precise about it, even though this was precise enough for the Montreal uh, German pavilion, this wasn't going to be precise enough for them to be able to cut patterns for Munich. The idea behind it is relatively simple. You know, that you have these X, Y, and Z uh, dimensions for each one of these, and you pull the form tighter, 
it deforms the shape that used to be a predictable square into something quite different. And then, of course, that's just pulling it in the X and Y. You can also pull it in the Z direction, too. And now we have all these different points. So there's one problem, and there was two models. How do you define the geometry of the structure and document it to build it? This isn't just in the abstract. You can't just have somebody look at a physical model and go, okay, now make that real. So then what Linkwitz had to do, these are what's called the cutting patterns, had to develop the dimensions for the actual model, the model that used where they're trying to plot this thing. Argus uh, was the computer scientist who was also part of this research team. And so he created uh, essentially the finite element method for analyzing these shells, which is also a brand new thing. The benefit of doing this seems to make sense, right? You can take this boundary condition, you apply a grid to it, you tell the computer that you're going to then change the Z direction in a few of these, and the computer ends up connecting point this point, point there, and now you can have this predictable sort of before and after. This was applied to the Mannheim Multi-Hall, which Fry Otto worked on as a consultant with Ove Erup's office immediately after that. They started off with the physical model. Now, this was not meant to be a tent structure. It was not meant to be a concrete model. It was meant to be a pavilion, a short-term pavilion, that used timber, a timber lattice grid shell. So it had the double curvature of a concrete anti-clastic form, but it was lightweight enough, like you would find then for a membrane form, but still could have this double curvature. So you can see this really detailed model in which they're hanging this upside down. Now, we need to pause here and say, here's Ove Arup's office using an Easler method about 15 years after he was pretty skeptical about Arup's or Easler's method. They then took this, weighed it, tried to get the predictable behavior out of it. And since Arup embrace this, you're looking at here the very first printout of a full digital model. They digitized every single one of these based on what they had learned from Linkwitz and, Ar and uh, uh, Argus, and they decided that they would be able to then work on some of these details to double layer this wood lath. I think this quote is absolutely perfect as we're, as we're wrapping up this idea of the use of physical models in the pre-digital to the now the post-digital. The usefulness of form finding in the physical model has come to its end. Computational methods. All right, He's talking about them to be able to perform analytical form finding without the need of physical models. Trying to replace all the things that didn't work about the physical models in uh, what he had noticed from the Montreal Pavilion and the Munich Pavilion. And it, it, even though it's, it's still there today, and it's a really, really fascinating building type, this lightweight lattice shell structure. And there's a lot that we'll be able to learn from this as we go forward. So what's next? What happens when Candela's supposed arbitrary original is no longer bound by the analog capacity? What if we don't have to rely on physical models to generate these new or interesting forms? The motivation for the experiments and the innovations that we've had up to this point have been about trying to find predictability, rigor, and finding, resolving, and optimizing this relationship between the form, the materials, the forces, and the construction. So what happens now that it becomes easier to navigate with new tools and models, forms like anti-clastics, all the things that Easler had promised could be easier in 1959, but without having to go through this arduous process. Where does that lead us? We'll see soon.